as noted earlier, our theme this year is the future depends on what you do today. What we do today will clearly have a big impact on what the future looks like, and that future is closer than you think. Our opening keynote speaker has served in various executive roles throughout his career, bringing more than 30 years of professional leadership. Frank Diana began his career at AT&T, holding various senior positions, including CIO for this company's international financial operation. Frank was the executive vice president of Inherent Corporation, where he led a business analytics growth initiative. He focused on leveraging advanced forms of analytics to deliver business outcomes for Alera Corporation. Frank served as CEO of Taxian Incorporated, a Silicon Valley software startup focused on the B2B enablement of small and mid-sized businesses. He also served as chief technology officer of Fujitsu Consulting, developing the company's extended enterprise vision. Frank is currently leading efforts to define and enable the future of business for TCS Global Consulting. Please join me in welcoming Frank Diana. Great to be here with you this morning. Let me see if I can get set up here. One second. Okay. So as mentioned, I'm a futurist, and I spend well, I spent the last seven years actually focused on the world, society, humanity, where it's all heading, and what it might mean not just to business leaders but to government leaders around the world. And I've had the pleasure of spending my time globally speaking in forums uh, where leaders are looking to understand not just where the world is going, but how fast it's getting. So what I want to do this morning in the next hour is share some of my journey with you uh, and give you the perspective that I'm seeing. I've had the benefit of spending these seven years in fairly large futurist networks. And so my exposure to some of this is fairly broad. Uh, and I tell audiences that I spend most of my time kind of straddling the world of fear and fascination. And I will try to show why in the next, uh, in the next hour. As I go, uh, if you do have questions, ask as we go. I'm not going to wait for the end for Q&A. There are two microphones that will float around. So I do ask that you wait for a microphone in the event that you do have a question. Uh, so let's have some fun. I'll use some video as we go. They're very impactful. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, describing the title and why I chose it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come down here eventually because of the uh, vi visual intensity of the, of the presentation. A journey through the looking glass. If you remember your fairy tales, the Snow White fairy tale had a looking glass theme. And when Alice stepped through the looking glass, she entered a world that was very unusual, uncertain, unexpected. And I truly believe that the world that we're entering is exactly that. And so I thought it was a very appropriate metaphor for this uh, view into the future. So in, in this case, where looking glasses have appeared in history, we have always experienced a tipping point. So in human history, there have been two primary tipping points. The first one from hunter-gatherer to our agrarian society, agriculture. And in that tipping point, civilization occurred. In the hunter-gatherer days, people had to move towards food. When agriculture became real, people settled and we civilized. So the first tipping point was really civilization. The second tipping point was the agriculture to industrial society shift, and that really created our modern society. And I'll go through a couple of these scenarios around the industrial age, which we are still in. Um, but the industrial age is shifting to a, a third tipping point. And so the common theme of this presentation is that I believe the world is going to experience its third massive tipping point in the next 20 years. And that tipping point will take us from our current industrial age to an automated society. And the only real question is, will we augment humanity in this process? Or will we fully, fully automate humanity in this process? And think about the implications of a fully automated society. And again, as I go through this, I will give you some reasons why I believe we're closer to the fully automated piece of this discussion than not. And again, every time we've experienced a tipping point, human development was advanced. So this is not a dystopian conversation in the context of human development, but hopefully it's a utopian conversation in the context of where we're seeing science and technology go. But I'll focus very quickly on why the Industrial Revolution really set the bar for our standard of living across the world, but specifically in the Western world. In the first revolution, driven primarily by steam, those three components, transport, communication, and energy, drove the revolution. And you'll see a theme here. In most revolutions, paradigm shifts across those three drove the revolution. So in the first revolution, 
It was all about mechanization, and it was dri driven by steam. However, there are still a whole lot of folks in the world that are not benefiting from mechanization, 600 million plus to be exact. In the second revolution, built on this platform, and a platform that we are still primarily built upon, the world changed. In this 100-year period, 1870 to 1970, the standard of living of the Western world was established, a period in history that economists believe will never experience again, because the convergence of forces that came together to create this modern society, uh, like World War II, for example, are one in a lifetime, one, one in a humanity kind of experience, and they believe it will never happen again. So that special century, the question is, will we, will we repeat some of this and actually advance society even further? So what I did in looking at this is created this wheel, and hopefully you can see some of this. But it, it looks at the areas of our well-being, what represents our standard of living. So if you look around the outer edge of the wheel, it's those areas of well-being like, like home and transport, et cetera. And on the inside, aligned with each of those areas, are those innovations and things that occurred during that 100-year period that actually set the bar. And as you can see from some of these things, electricity is an obvious one, but sanitation and running water, uh, maybe not as obvious. And in some of the areas of work and labor and those kinds of things, many things occurred in that era to really support people and the advancement of society. And if you look back to the pre-1870 days, it was not a pleasant time to be alive. And every look at history indicates that our current living standards are obviously higher than they've ever been. So I'm going to come back to this notion of standard of living as we think about where the world is heading. But this is just a, a historical look at what happened after that revolution. But as you can see from that uh, visual, there's still a lot of people in the world that aren't benefiting from the benefits of that revolution itself. So lots of folks still don't have electricity or sanitation or clean running water. And so again, we'll come back to some of that. And along the way, the third phase of this revolution was the third revolution. It started in the late 60s, it really exploded in the 70s and 80s, and it was built on computation and information and communication with the latter stages of this period being the internet revolution, which fundamentally changed the communication paradigm. The first time one of those three components changed since that revolution. So the third revolution, impactful as well, not maybe as impactful as the prior two, and yet almost four billion people in the world still did not have internet access. So as impactful as those revolutions were, we still have a humanity that is struggling in parts of the world just to raise the bar as, as far as the US and Europe and other places have. So what's happening next? The fourth revolution, which is where the World Economic Forum believes we're heading, and believes it will be much more transformative than the ones I just referenced, we're on the verge of this fourth revolution. And again, the fourth revolution is going to be built on another platform. And this will be the first time since that second revolution that all three paradigms shift transport, communication, and energy. And this is very meaningful because as we've seen with that second revolution, when these three things shift together, the world changes considerably. And so the expectation here is that energy will shift for the first time since the fossil fuel era was established. And we're already seeing the renewable energy footprint expand in Europe specifically, and it will continue to do so. Communication, uh, I don't think we've seen anything yet in the context of where communication is going, and I will go through more of that as we go through this. And then obviously transport, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, uh, high-speed transport like the Hyperloop, space travel, passenger drones, all of which are coming if not already here. So these shifts are meaningful, and why I believe the next 20 years will really be a fast evolution of our society in ways we haven't seen before. But the question is, when this happens, or if it happens the way some believe it will, can we impact humanity at a broader scale? Can we elevate the global standard of living around the world, not just in pockets of the world, like those prior revolutions? So to explore that question, I built the second wheel. And I'll go through this. Don't worry about the eye test. We'll, we'll build this. But layering around that same first wheel, some of the innovations and changes that we expect will happen in the next 20 years can we establish a higher standard of living across those areas of well-being? So let's take these one at a time and give you a sense as to why I think we will. The first is health. And we'll get into healthy life extension in a few minutes. But these things, like precision medicine, personalized medicine based on our genome, uh, even rejuvenation biotechnologies, where many believe will reverse the aging process, and many believe by 2034 cancer will be cured. 
So if these things start to occur, our healthy lives get extended. And if you think about the implications to humanity if we live longer, um, but, and we'll come back to this, those are considerable implications to humanity. So health is going to change. The next, from a food perspective, there's a belief that we need to establish more food in the next 50 years than we had in 10,000 prior years before it because of the population growth expected. And so from a food perspective, there is a feeling that we can establish abundance at the food level through some of these things. For example, desalination, which requires a significant amount of energy, could provide clean water to the world. And it's interesting when we look at some of these things in combination. The energy requirement for that process will drive more and more focus on renewable energies and explode the pace at which those things occur. So some of these things represent virtuous cycles that feed one another. So food and the potential for abundance. Transport, as I mentioned a couple times, is likely to change. And I'm going to come down here so I don't have to keep walking in front of there. Um, this one's impactful, because if we do think in the context of autonomous vehicles, high-speed travel, even virtual reality, and we'll get into that one, and maybe you don't have to ever leave your house and be anywhere in the world, what does that mean to airline travel and the way we think about transportation, for example? And that's one being the home. The home has not really changed since that second revolution. What we do in the home, we do in the home. But look at some of the things that are listed here, from safe living to you know, robots that clean our homes for us, wouldn't that be nice? All the way down to uh, prosumers, where you're actually building your own or manufacturing your own things through 3D printing in your house. And you, in the home, could ultimately get to a place where you are self-sufficient from an energy perspective, never having to be on the grid again. Because the energy store, storage required to just have all of your energy needs, are, the capacity gets there. So even the home changes. From there, energy, as I mentioned a couple times, we're already seeing renewable in the footprint in Europe explode. And so we will continue to see not just renewables, but nuclear fusion and other kinds of cleaner forms of energy uh, start to represent the bigger piece of the footprint. Again, in the 2030s, the belief system is that we will have uh, really moved away from fossil fuels at a very high, high level. So energy, another big one. From their communications, and I'm going to come back to this one a couple times, because I think one of the critical changes from a societal level is the way we communicate with one another and how, how the changes in the next several years will drive that. I won't get into these in detail because I will spend some time on that, but if you look at that list, you know, we're currently in a touch-based communication era if you think about our phones. Right? We're moving towards a gesture and looking-based interface with one another, even a brain-oriented interface with one another. And again, I'll spend a little more time on that one. Next is information, and this one's an obvious one as we're starting to see considerable changes in, in the information subset around IoT and how that's going to explode our data. Uh, even things like compute capacity. And much of what I'm talking about here is dependent upon the continued advancement in our computing capacity. So quantum computing and, so, and DNA computing and other forms of computing will likely expand and evolve to places where we can support some of the things that we're talking about here. And then next is work. I get into a lot of conversations when it comes to work, because as you can imagine, this discussion really leads to a jobs conversation. And where is work going by 2030? And so some of these things, whether it's the universal basic income discussions that are happening in Canada and Europe, or robot taxes, which I'll get into in a little bit, these are all based on the phenomena that says not just the loss of jobs, but the reimagining of work itself in the next 20 years. And then from there, clothing, actually a pretty funny one because clothing hasn't changed except for fashion since the 1870s and what we do with clothes, for example. But look at some of the things listed here. Your clothing being a data source, and it will clearly be a data source in the future. Your clothing potentially being able to capture your own energy and transmit that energy to something that can fuel your house or your car, for example. Uh, so all kinds of things are going to happen with clothing. And just a sense as to even something as basic as clothing changing. And then last but not least, then my personal favorite is education. At the heart of the jobs discussion, is primarily an education discussion because lifelong learning and reskilling ourselves is going to be critical in the jobs conversation of the future. And so the education paradigm that drives how we learn has to change because we're not really prepared to reskill at the pace that we're going to have to reskill not just our children but ourselves. And so education is another really big one. Okay, so some examples of how we might upgrade our standard of living through some of the innovations that are coming. And all of this really does represent sort of a, a reflection back on that second industrial revolution and the convergence that occurred to drive it. So across these dimensions, the economy, science, technology, even a large growing ethics conversation, which I'll get into, the convergence is happening. And it is 
uh, spiraling us towards this transformative period that I referenced. So what I want to do is spend considerable time building a story around our emerging future. And it's going to start with a conversation around where science and technology are taking us. And so the first piece of this visual, and I, and I built it using curves because I wanted to show that some of this stuff is, is line of sight kinds of things. Some of it is so far off that we just can't see its implications. So the first bill is, is the digital bill. We know that the internet transforms society. Social and mobile, obviously, uh, the cloud, all this talk about big data, that's the foundation. And a lot of the leaders that I talk to still don't have the foundation in place. Critical, because what's coming next relies on that foundation. These are all innovation accelerators, some of which we already see and impacting us already, and some in the next five years that will start to explode at some level. But again, it requires that digital foundation. And then beyond it, just a whole series of things that we can't even imagine in terms of how they might impact society. I want to spend a little bit of time on a couple of these um, just to give a sense as to what they might mean. For example, way up on the curve, somewhere off in the future, wireless power transmission. So what if we have solar satellites in orbit collecting the sun's rays closer to the sun and transmitting its energy down to Earth wirelessly? So as you're driving your electric vehicle, it's recharging itself. No requirement for wired infrastructure anymore. And think about the implications of that. As I go up even further, geoengineering is the ability of science to manipulate our climate. So obviously some potential applications for some of the carbon issues we have today, but how about manipulating the climate of Mars so that we can inhabit Mars, which is on the agenda of many of our uh, techno-philanthropists out there. And then further up the curve is brain-to-brain uh, -brain communication. The belief that we will someday, not too far off in the future, communicate with one another brain-to-brain. -brain. Now this is the first time I get to say this with my wife in the audience, but I don't want her in my head, and I don't want to be in your head. <laughs> But yes, uh, can we wait for a microphone or anything? Anybody have to go back? Yep, one second. So it seems that the digital era has brought on a level of vulnerability that we've not seen, I think, in you know, my lifetime. Yeah. Um, as we continue to go up this curve, you know, what are there thoughts being put in place to kind of thwart nefarious activities that are obviously going to happen as a result? Yeah, the, the, that question and related questions come up all the time. So, so a couple of things. One, there's the destructive side of this discussion, and I'll get into this when I, I talk, talk to ethics, and there's the constructive side. Any discussion that happens around trying to gate the progress here, one, I, I think is futile because for several reasons which I'll get into but also you have the potential to gate some of the positive effects like solving cancer and other kinds of things, right? So there's a concern that too much regulation, an Elon Musk warning sign around AI, could get in the way of advancing the positive side of, of this potential set of outcomes. The negative side of this is, is the behavior that you referenced, and, and I have a whole list of things that I'll show you in terms of things that could happen as a result that are not so positive for society, right? The challenge is, even if the U.S. decided to slow this process down, because historically, if government felt society wasn't ready for this, it pulled back on the gate, right? There's no gate. There's no ability to pull back on this stuff right now. And so I'll get into that in more detail when I speak about ethics, but slowing down, if we do, China's not, right? China's gonna move very aggressively. They've already stated they wanna dominate in many, many of these spaces, right? So the competitive disadvantage for the U.S. will ultimately outweigh the potential slowdown for societal uh, good, if you will. Did that help with some of that? Okay. Okay, so brain-to-brain -brain communication, uh, lots going on in that, in that space, so it's not just science fiction, and it begins with the ability to actually communicate from brain to computer. And so the progress that's been made in that space is absolutely phenomenal. For the first time, a quadriplegic drove a race car with mind control. To enhance awareness, we built a very special car. Yeah. Our innovation team combined EEG brain power technology with steering algorithms and track mapping. O carro tem um computador de bordo que traduz esses pensamentos para comandos efetivos no carro. Ele consegue atuar em todos os elementos mecânicos do carro. Direita. Acelera. Acelera. 
idea of just moving an object with my mind is already the stuff of science fiction. But driving a Formula One car, it takes it up to another level. Many other examples, but if you looked at this example, not just the progress as far as viewing the brain computer interfaces, but solving a disability kind of challenge, right? So very constructive kinds of use of that technology. And I can show you other videos where a, a comparable approach to solving Parkinson's, where somebody's sitting there with Parkinson's and can't move, and they flip a switch and he's up and walking around as if nothing was wrong with him. And we don't want to get in the way of those kinds of advancements. However, there are other things that might not be as positive. So if I go back down the curve, and I'm doing this for a reason because it sets up the next build of this vision, virtual reality in the next five years will start to take hold in various industries. And how we interact will change significantly as virtual reality takes hold. But it's the longer term view of virtual reality that, that sets up the next conversation around the kinds of scenarios that are emerging. Uh, once virtual reality goes inside our brains, and that's, that'll be here by the late 2020s. Uh, and basically, I mean, my brain doesn't directly feel things. There's signals going into my brain. We can actually trap those signals yeah. and actually send into the brain signals representing a virtual environment. And so the computer will actually create the environment. And then we can be virtual actors in a virtual environment uh, and do any of the things we do in real reality, like be together, t hug each other, whatever, uh, in, in a virtual environment. Uh, we can eat in a virtual environment and have that sensual experience because our brain is perceiving these signals as if they were coming from the real world, but it's actually the virtual world. So Ray Kurzweil, head of engineering at Google and also a very famous futurist, and his predictions have been fairly accurate. You've probably heard him say late 2020s is when that world emerges. That's the complete blurring of the physical and virtual world. And as I said before, if you could be anywhere in the world but what, without ever leaving your home, uh, what does that do to our transportation paradigm, for example? Uh, if you could eat in this virtual world without ha ever having eaten and feel satisfied and fulfilled that you ate, what does that mean to our world? So what this basically starts to set up is a second view of this emerging future, and that is the series of future scenarios that are being formed by that first curve. So the building blocks from a technology and science perspective are leading to a series of paradigm shifts that our world is likely to experience in the next 20 years. Now, there's no telling how far these things go in terms of their implications, but 10% of each of these is world-changing stuff. And what I want to do is really spend a couple of minutes on a few of these. The first one was the blurred reality. So what I just showed as far as virtual reality really leads to a world that's blurred completely. You can't distinguish between the, the virtual and the physical. And again, what does that mean to society? But there's other things happening. So we'll go back down the curve. This one is what I started with, the automation of everything. Do we, because we can somewhere down the road with AI, robotics, blockchain, and other kinds of technologies, automate everything? And then, of course, in, in several audiences, people will say, well, you can't automate everything. How about this? Yesterday, a robot taking a swipe at this, David, and what else would you expect here at the Waste Management Phoenix Open? Really, that robot is called L. Drick. How's this? And both L. Dricks have done that at 16. What <laughs> that? Only here. Okay, the... maybe we could automate some of that. And that is really right-brain kinds of things. Those are the things, I'm sorry, left-brain kinds of things. Those are the things that math and analytics and what we were trained to do from a business perspective I, we can see how maybe math can be used to do some of that. But what about the right brain side of us? As humans, it's these softer things that really make us who we are. And many people believe in a world that's automated, we're going to have to be really good at leveraging that side of our brain. And, and I mean, robots can't do that stuff, can they? Yeah, this is uh, Sophia. Uh -huh. And Sophia is a social robot. Mm. And she has artificial intelligence software that we've developed at Hanson Robotics, which can process visual data. She can see people's faces. Uh, she can process uh, conversational data, emotional data, and uh, use all of this to form relationships with people. Okay. Uh, so, 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 I'll just say... What? This is like... You see how awkward my first day turned. <laughs> it's a robot 
Oh, I'm already I'm getting nervous around a robot, a very pretty robot. Um, do, what, do I just say hello to it? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, my God. <laughs> do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show, The Tonight Show. Uh, Sophia, can you tell me a joke? Sure. What cheese can never be yours? What cheese can never be mine? I don't know. Nacho cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. That's not... uh, I, like, I like nacho cheese. Nacho cheeses. Ew. Gosh, you did ew. Uh, I'm getting laughs. Yeah. Maybe I should host the show. Okay, all right. <laughs> So in the description, when he first started describing Sophia as the human-like robot, he talked about AI um, and visual recognition capabilities. So what Sophia is doing there is reading who she's interacting with space and adjusting her expression as she goes. She gets much more conversation with you as she learns more about you, and so she gets to be a companion over time. I spent some time at the Milken Institute Health Summit in D.C. about eight months ago, and one of the leading causes of death among the elderly is said to be isolation and loneliness. Now, what if a companion robot such as this solves that problem? And we are dealing with an aging society, so that problem becomes more acute. So again, something that could feel pretty creepy, but having an application that solves a real-world challenge. Can anybody tell me what that is? What was it? DNA. No. Any guesses? Neural network. Yes. A neural network. No, no. This is a car frame. <laughs> <laughs> so, a series of scientists instrumented a car, raced it around a racetrack for a week, fed all the data to an artificial intelligence, and one simple instruction create a better aerodynamic dynamic car that's biologically inspired. And this is what the AI came up with. And the scientists concluded that there's no way a human could have done this. And it is indeed more aerodynamically sound than anything we could have created. And that's an AI doing creative design, which is another one of those things on that list of uh, right brain things. And then there's this. of how artificial intelligence and others could be creeping into even those uh, right brain kinds of things that make us who we are. So moving along the curve is the healthy life extension scenario that I mentioned before. Uh, life scientists believe that the first person to live to 200 has already been born. So let that sink in for a little bit. They think the pace at which longevity is occurring at two years over a series of time is really underestimating the progress that's being made in the field. And so 200 in some child's lifetime is not a question. 140, 150 is probably a very reasonable expectation in the not too distant future. Now what, and a healthy life, because we're reversing the aging process. So you're not just aging, but you're aging in a healthy fashion. So what does that mean to life insurance, retirement, even institutions like marriage and having children? Again, at its core, some of these things, if they play out, challenge our core belief systems, those things that it's all we've known. So an open mind and thinking differently is part of this process as we look at its potential progression. And then one of my personal favorites, and I only focus on it because it's fun, sports. Now, what could happen to sports? So sports, in terms of viewing, will change considerably in the sense that we could be on the 50-yard line of any game virtually and view that game as if we were right there. We can view a game in the future through the helmet of Tom Brady and see that line sack us much like he's seeing it. The venues that we watch sports in will change considerably as the prices of those things go up and, and the middle class actually view sports like this in a third party venue where they can actually be there and holographically see the replay all the way around it. 
And so the viewing experience changes. But what about the athlete? If genomics heads where it's going, and genetic engineering is, is a potential, and robotics is a potential, does the athlete and the league have to be sort of a, an enhanced league versus a natural league? So consider the potential for even sports. <coughs> It seems like something out of a sci-fi movie, but what if you could hack your DNA to make you run faster, jump higher, or become stronger? Elite athletes are always looking for a competitive edge, training hard to achieve peak performance. But some take it further, pushing beyond the natural limits of their bodies through artificial means. Anti-doping agencies try to stay one step ahead of the cheats, developing new tests to identify performance-enhancing drugs. But there is a new technology on the horizon that could be a game-changer. Gene doping is when an athlete edits some of their genes to permanently alter their DNA, enhancing their sporting performance. Already real? Genetic screening, which is the process of understanding whether a child has a prowess in, in terms of speed or strength or would be good at a specific sport, is already happening in places around the world. And then that child gets shut out of specific activities because they're just not going to be very good at it. And when you go down the path of changing our own DNA, now you're opening the door to designer babies and all kinds of different discussions, back to the ethics conversation of before. And further up this curve, some of the scarier things is this belief that somewhere on the horizon we will birth the next human species and it will be a human machine <coughs> merged species where we are part human and part machine. And, and specifically the transhumanist community believes that we're arrogant as a species to think that we're the last species to populate this planet. Now without even getting into the spiritual sides of these conversations, that's a scary thought and back to the ethics conversation which we will get back into. And at the top of the curve, Way up there is the complete elimination of death. So the scientists have made this a math problem. There are at least 60 Silicon Valley companies focused on specifically eliminating death. And of course, in that audience, I'll hear somebody say, I'm going to get hit by a bus tomorrow. If you wait 20 years, if you get hit by that bus, your brain will already be uploaded to the internet and will just download it into a robot and you'll live on it forever. Right? So this is the belief system in many of these venues that feel that we can even conquer the death issue. And, and in time, if we add 10 years of longevity to our life, and in, in that 10 years we solve other problems and add 10 more years, the belief really is that some, somewhere down the road they can solve that problem as well. I'll, I'll leave that one there. And if that's not enough, there's all kinds of things going on at the societal level. Now we know that so, uh, some of the technology and science that I'm talking about has actually changed society today. You know, how many of us complain about our kids on the phone constantly and, forgetting how to interact with humans. Right? Those kinds of things have been societal changes. And so there's an interesting dynamic at play. Those curves that I just showed you, the science technology curve specifically, has changed the path of society. But it's happening in the other direction as well. So for example, in the case of disease, poverty, and disability, there's a lot going on focused on solving those problems. And for the first time in history, there are techno-philanthropists focused on it. Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and others who are spending their wealth trying to solve some of these problems. The other side of that coin, though, there's no gate. There's nothing stopping them from advancing this agenda at any pace they see fit. But it is aimed at solving some of these challenges. So that's an example of how the science and technology curve is altering society. The other example is ownership to access. We, I believe that we will enter an access-based society where you won't own your cars anymore. You won't own basically anything anymore because it's just not, it's not cost uh, it just doesn't work, right? So you move from ownership to access. So again, those curves are influencing even things like that. And then last but not least, I'll focus on this slide anyway, is the generations, five of them, that will be in our workforces by 2020. So Generation Z will enter the workforce 2020. The millennial generation is already the biggest piece of the workforce at 34%, maybe even 35 by now. And so the generational divide that it represents is a challenge for leaders. Sag mal, Papa, habe ich dich noch gar nicht gefragt? Wie kommst du denn eigentlich mit dem neuen iPad zurecht, was wir dir zum Geburtstag geschenkt haben? Na gut. Mit den ganzen Apps kommst du klar? Was denn für Apps? Geh mal bitte nicht schnell zur Seite. Uh, but we do have 
challenges as generations enter the workforce. And if we live forever, of course, there's going to be many generations working at the same time. So collectively, if you take every bit that I just walked through together, it represents our emerging future. And so this complex visual, which has a series of building blocks on it, a number of dots that need connecting, is one way to, to really get people to understand and appreciate the complexity of the world that we're dealing with, the uncertainty of it all. And one of the key leadership traits that I believe is going to make people successful in the future is an ability to see this at some level and connect dots in a way that help us understand the potential implications. I don't think we'll ever predict this stuff anymore, but there is a way to at least start thinking about this in ways that allow us to, to move forward. So taking it all in, each piece that I just went through, uh, I think most people agree that some kind of reset is coming. A great reset that talks to the fact that this third tipping point that I referenced is probably on the horizon. And I love that quote because I think it perfectly represents the struggle. We're really dealing with all these innovations that I just referenced, but our mindset is still based in the 20th century, and our institutions are 19th century institutions, and that is the biggest challenge. If you think about our policies, our regulations, even our processes in our own companies, etc., they were built for a different era. They were built for a manufacturing era that did not move at this pace. And what's happening today is going to collapse every one of those institutions. So I believe we're going to see a series of changes at the institutional level, or I hope we do, if we're going to survive in this emerging future. Well, I think of this all in terms of canaries in the coal mine. Maybe you've heard that phrase, canary in a coal mine. And you might wonder, why are we talking about canaries in coal mines? Well, coal miners used to take canaries with them underground. If the mine shaft had dangerous amounts of gases, such as methane or carbon dioxide, Canaries would show distress or die before the people would. The canaries were more susceptible, and so they provided a valuable warning signal when something was wrong. So when I look at today's world, I wonder, what are the canaries in the coal mine? What are the weakest parts of the system? And they're failing, but it's not just a localized failure. It's giving us a broader and deeper warning of bigger stresses on the entire system. Throughout history, those warning signs have been there. And until they accumulated in ways that, that really impacted our world, they were ignored. And so we see warning signs today. And the question is, will we do something about the warning signs? So those warning signals, for example, we talked about work and the potential implications to work, need to be addressed. Right now, if a human worker does you know, $50,000 worth of work in a factory, that income is taxed. If the robot comes in to do the same thing, you'd think that we'd tax the robot at a similar level. What the world wants is to take this opportunity to make all the goods and services we have today and free up labor, let us do a better job of reaching out to the elderly, having smaller class size, helping kids with special needs. Now, all of those are things where human empathy and understanding are, are still very, very unique, and we still deal with an immense shortage of people to help out uh, there. And so, if you can take the labor that used to do the thing automation in places, and both financially and training-wise and fulfillment-wise, have that person go off and do these other things, you're net ahead. Some very key points in there, from education, to shifting resources to some of those human-related things, uh, again, aimed at advancing our human development as opposed to not. But at the core of this is an appreciation that what's coming in terms of robots and automation uh, undermines sort of the, uh, the whole playing field in terms of jobs. And the robot tax discussion is an interesting one. There's a lot of other issues that aren't being discussed here with going down that path. But it is a warning signal that needs to be heeded. And it's just one example of the warning signals that that one video talked about. And then there's a number of other things. So if I look at canaries and coal mines, the structures of our day, and I talked about this from an institution context, have to shift. If we don't move to a place where our institutions, our own structures, are aligned with where the world is, as opposed to where the world was, we're all going to struggle. There's just really no way to transform our way around this without addressing some of these things. And in the insurance space, for example, regulatory frameworks will change. And I've talked to some CEOs that have said, why don't we as insurance leaders drive that change? 
which I think is a great healthy way to think about that. But structure has to change if we're to survive in the future. And I want to give you an example of one potential structural change that I do believe is coming. Um, and this is a massive change to a, a society that has been used to one way of looking at something. In the world that I described during that, the second revolution, where we set the standard of living, our industry construct was born for a number of good reasons, from command and control required to do that, those kinds of things, to the capital intensity of building railroads and our roads, et cetera. Our, our industries were born. And we've, been, we've known nothing but this for 200 plus years. In the world that I described in that second uh, visual that really advances society, hopefully, in the next turn, this, there's no vertical orientation to that world. The value of creation and capture that happens there is horizontal. It has no regard for industry boundaries. And so if you think about the connected car or the autonomous vehicle, the value created on that piece of software on wheels is being created by a number of different industries with no regard to the boundary. And so what happens in the next 30 to 40 years is a complete collapse of our industry structure and a, a move towards ecosystems. I don't know that these are the nine finite sets of ecosystems that exist in that world. It's, a, it's just a shot of taking, it's just taking a shot at creating some of those. Um, but I think that shift is going to be very real. The industries that we know disappear and an ecosystem construct replaces it. And again, the vertical orientation gives way to a horizontal orientation because it's all about how value is created and captured and that vertical mechanism is no longer the right way to think about that. So just an example of a massive structural change that I think is coming. And underpinning it, and something that I think will impact your worlds in the next decade, is the movement towards the platform business model. And the platform business model basically is an Uber, Airbnb, Facebook kind of model that says we orchestrate a network. And the benefits of network orchestration as a model, both in the context of scale and price to revenue ratios far exceeds any other business model. And so what we're starting to see is a number of companies moving to at least embed that business model as part of their portfolio. And as they do that, it really drives us towards a world where the platforms start to take over. And so platforms eat any other kind of business over time. And so if we just play this out for a second, we'll see some big players drive those ecosystems, think Amazon. We'll see a number of other players participate in value creation and capture within the context of that ecosystem. And let's use Traveler as an example. Our traveling ecosystem today is changing considerably. There's a number of different stakeholders that are emerging. And so you think about autonomous vehicles and the role they play in that ecosystem. There's a whole bunch of stakeholders I can add. There's going to be players that bring that ecosystem together. We're not talking about Expedia or Orbitz. We're talking about a massive ecosystem that brings all components of travel together. And so this is how it starts. And as it does so, we're going to see redundant ecosystems form all over the place across every industry as we know it today. And it's in the consolidation that always happens after redundancy begins that those finite set of ecosystems form. So that's the progression or evolution that I envision occurring that takes us from our current world to a world that looks more like that. So with all of that, it's putting pressure on leaders to start thinking about this world differently. And it's interesting that in the last 18 months, whereas maybe 18 months ago a discussion with an insurance CEO viewed much of this as science fiction, those discussions have changed considerably. So the appreciation for seeing this future at some level, appreciating it's not just science fiction, is starting to really take hold. And that's very, very encouraging because of all the things wrapped around here, the uncertainty of our world is not going away. And so I love the quote, we have to rehearse this future and really prepare for a range of possibilities because we have a number of possible futures emerging, but no one can tell you exactly which ones will emerge. And anybody that tries to is, is really lying to you. So a quick exercise to really underscore the point. And this is based on a series of what if questions. And this one will focus on the autonomous vehicle and what happens if it does replace ownership and uh, the need to actually drive at all. So first and foremost, the mobility ecosystem changes considerably. You've been dreaming about this since you were a little kid. Your own personal air transportation. Passenger drone. Taking autonomous to the sky. Input your destination on the touch screen and passenger drone takes you where you want to go. Safely, quickly, and in comfort. Traffic jams, done. Driving stress, done. Wasting time, done. Already happening in Dubai. And there's a belief that by 2024, there'll be 10 million 
passenger drone flights a day versus the current 100,000 airline flights a day. So the implications to mobility at the biggest level is considerable. So a quick exercise, and this one is impactful in my travels because it, it really opens the lens in terms of the breadth of these scenarios and how impactful they are. So if we focus first on potential implications of mobility, there are things like the fatality reduction expected when this actually takes hold is considerable. A human error is behind most fatalities, and if you take the human out of the equation, we're going to see a significant drop in fatalities. Well, if that happens, my personal favorite is that our lawyers are impacted. Sorry, General Counsel, where we are. <laughs> Bye. Body shots potentially disappear because the cars don't get in accidents. And of course, if they do have a hailstorm, which I've been told in some settings, you're going to 3D print that car somewhere in the future for less than you would repair it anyway. Uh, premiums could disappear, although that's also an interesting one. There are a number of CEOs not concerned about this, and they should be. But the other side of that discussion has to happen. Where are our risk strengths and expertise applied in this future world versus maybe the, the car premium, for example? Things like hospital revenues will plunge, and this is a very big number, $450 billion of emergency room visits and health insurance revenues that disappear if we stop going to emergency rooms so we're not hurt in car accidents. Moving along, uh, here's a, a big implication to cities. That car's going to obey traffic laws. No more ticket. That car won't have to park, and so all the parking revenues that go to the bottom line of the city go away as well. So implications to the city landscape. And other kinds of municipal revenue drop as well. Cities, our truck drivers uh, participate as they travel in hotel or eating or other kinds of things when they travel to the cities, as we do as well. If you can do all those things in the car as you're driving, you're not going to spend that money in that city landscape. How about environmentally? Mixed bag here. Some people think that because driverless cars will enable the elderly to drive, the disabled to drive, even our children who have to wait for their parents to take them somewhere to drive, more congestion occurs. The other side of that coin says that we have the need for 70% less cars because an optimized network of cars, 80% optimized versus the 4% that our cars are used today, you're going to have less cars on the road. And I think it's going to end up somewhere in the middle when it's all said and done. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, we might reduce the need to be mobile completely in that virtual world that Ray Kurzweil described earlier. And moving along, on the value chain side, we don't need car dealers in the future because the car will be sold to transportation networks, not car dealers, so they disappear. The uh, part suppliers will dwindle because the ultimate driverless car sits on an electric vehicle that has far fewer parts. So a big impact to the uh, value chain and societally came up before bad behavior is enabled because that car, if we think it's a weapon today, what happens when there's no, no person in it. Uh, inequality worsens. And this comes up a lot, the inequality worsening problem, because those that can afford these cars initially will be the wealthy. And so uh, inequality can worsen at that level. Uh, and, we've, and weapons. Russia already has an autonomous drone submarine that's weaponized, that can, can just go underwater autonomously to a target. So those are some of the implications as part of the, the exercise. But there are also the responses that are forming today. And this is a space that I believe is driving this really not science fiction kind of conversation that's now happening. And so what are some of the potential responses? This ecosystem is forming, and I won't get into a lot of detail here, but last mile automated. So when the drone drops off the package at your door, or the little sidewalk robot appears at your door, or the van that is autonomous shows up with lockers and notifies you that you can come out and unlock your locker with a code and get your package. So those kinds of things are coming to automate the last mile. So think of the implications of that to jobs and other kinds of things. So those are the kinds of ecosystem things that happen. The platform, lots of virtual cycles going on here. The range issues associated with electric vehicles disappear if it's part of our network, because you know where that car has to go. And so you can send the appropriate car. Over time, the battery and storage issues get resolved, and it really does become the, the dominant platform for these vehicles. Moving along societally, I mentioned mobility being extended. We, as lifelong learners in the future, can learn in our vehicles because we're not driving anymore, so we can continue to, to learn. Uh, ownership, I believe, will shift access. And because 30% of our cityscapes are, are dominated by parking, we'll see that land repurpose. As a matter of fact, cities were built around the car. When the car stops being the dominant piece of a city landscape, what do the future cities look like? And keep an eye on what's happening in Saudi Arabia and Toronto, and even Columbus, Ohio, where uh, those smart city agendas are evolving. 
And so the architectures of those cities will be interesting to see how that evolves. And then timing, hard to say, um, but governments could accelerate adoption. Uh, some, some people say, you're never taking my car from me. Well, if the current phenomena of fatalities increasing in the US four years in a row because of distracted driving continues, or we, we're not going to walk backwards. So do we accelerate the path to you know, stage five fully autonomous vehicles? And, and do governments do that to offset the fatality issues that are emerging? Hard to say. Do we accelerate this because China is, as I mentioned earlier? So timing is a very difficult one to talk to. OK, just an example of one scenario and its potential implications. And there's so much more just an example. So back to the ethics conversation, which is now a very big conversation in the futures community. For all the things that we've been talking about, you know, do we want this to continue un unabated, no governance mechanisms at all? And the dialogue right now is, should we be creating governance mechanisms, much like after World War II, where we created these bodies to manage potential nuclear proliferation? So we don't have that kind of cooperation because there's no real catalyst like World War II to create these entities. But should we? So two examples. I already showed you the virtual reality example. But let me give you two more examples of potential places we're going. One, in the case of Ray Kurzweil, again, he believes that we will have these little nanobots floating through our bloodstream in not too distant future, which intercepts our electric signals. And by mere thought, you could bring information right into your head right from the cloud. So you are brain connected to the cloud somewhere in the not too distant future. And so you are part biological thinker and part non-biological thinker. The other scenario is Elon Musk's scenario, where he believes that AI will dominate us as a human species, and we can't let that happen. So in his world, we layer uh, digital cortex above our own brains so that we are part man, part machine, and evolve along with AI so they can never undermine us. Now, those two scenarios really makes this ethics conversation hit home for me. And I always ask audiences what, what they feel about this. But in the interest of time, I won't do that here. But I will show you that uh, this survey asking that specific question. Do those scenarios, are they good for humanity or not so good for humanity? And you can see that, at least anonymously, 52% say that this is good for humanity. You know, I'll leave it there as opposed to a value judgment. But that's the ethics conversation. It's a, it's a real needed conversation. And as I said earlier in the discussion around the balance, these are the things that could happen. On one side, to enhance society. On the other side, potentially diminish society. And without mechanisms in place to balance this, then we're either likely to stifle the positive things through over-regulating these industries or uh, not regulating enough and ending up somewhere on this side. No answers here in terms of where these all go, goes, but really challenging issues ahead in terms of dealing with the ethics discussion. So all of this says that the way we think about this future has got to change. And so our journey forward has to really take a different lens. And going all the way back to the beginning of the presentation, if we look at this through the looking glass kind of view, it basically says that seeing this world has to be one of the dominant things that we as leaders do. Seeing it for what it is and understanding potential paths for these scenarios so that we can react to them at some level. The second piece is because we can't predict and because there are possible futures emerging, how do we rehearse these things in ways that help us understand the potential paths, which future scenarios might emerge, et cetera. And then lastly, if we can't adapt as these shifts occur, and they will, one, occur over and over again, and two, the speed at which they occur will increase. And so the foundation of most organizations is not adaptive. So one of the things that we know as traditional organizations is that we have to change the way we think about organizations so that we can adapt as these shifts occur. So one of the key things is resilience and adaptive uh, organizations. If they take one thing away from this presentation, it's that. How do we get to a place of resilience? And these two quotes are fascinating to me. Uh, really like this first one. I mean, it's fascinating that 80% of the CEOs said they would bypass a decade's worth of innovation if it meant missing one quarterly result. And the second piece, which I absolutely agree with, is our training and education will undermine our abilities to really survive in this world. Because we have been trained to manage everything as shareholder value. It had its purpose in time, um, but it will get in the way of moving forward in a world that looks like the world I'm describing. And so, quite frankly, this doesn't work. <laughs> but we could overcompensate and go here. 
new titles and roles aren't going to solve this problem. As I said before, we're going to see at the organizational level that there's two transformations that have to occur in, in businesses today. One is to reposition ourselves for today, which means resilience and relevance in the world that's emerging. And two, we have to create tomorrow. The growth side of the equation is going to be based on how we deal with tomorrow. I tell most CEOs that in 10 years' time, most of your revenue will come from non-traditional places. And I firmly believe that, given the pace at which things are changing. And so it goes back to dealing with these things, not just superficial organizational changes that we think help. So uh, in wrapping up, um, I love the quote, my favorite quote in the entire deck, because I really come back to education each time I have this conversation, is that we have to learn to learn, unlearn, and relearn on a consistent basis if we are to survive in this world. And those characteristics that I referenced before, at least for the foreseeable future, are the most important characteristic set. And so from an organizational capability standpoint, from a hiring standpoint, from a retention standpoint, these things are critical in terms of the associates we bring into our businesses if we're to survive and advance in the world that's emerging. And it will require each of us as leaders to think differently. And so as I flip through this, the thinking differently, really we should look back to those leaders of our past that had something about their characteristic set that enabled them to be very strong leaders. And embracing some of this as leaders in today's world as we move forward and address the challenges of our future. And so with that, I uh, thank you all. And I think there might be a question, yes? you didn't touch on is uh, global climate change and we're reaching a very close to a tipping point like on the temperature of the oceans we're seeing the melting of the ice caps yeah. uh, are there any great plans to do that without uh, us basically you know getting rid of all fossil fuels <laughs> there's a strong belief that negotiating this away is not going to be the path forward, but geoengineering, as I mentioned before, science kind of answer to this problem is really the, the fastest path forward. The question, the concern is, um, there are implications to some of those things that we might do, for example, putting glass particles up in orbit that reflect the sun back up, or other kinds of techniques that might solve, at, accelerate the path forward for that specific issue. The challenge is, the implications aren't understood, there's a concern that some rogue nations do it anyway and that create challenges for the rest of humanity as they do. Uh, and so I'm not sure geoengineering, at least now, is the right answer. Um, and the carbon issue is a significant issue. But there are other answers like a, a, a mechanisms, again, science-driven, that really pull the carbon out of the air, other kinds of approaches that people are looking at. But it, it's one of those sticky challenges that I don't think anybody has their hands around. Yes, sir. So, as you were talking, uh -oh. the words that kept coming out of your mouth going into my brain was job loss, job loss, job loss, job loss. This is great as long as society continues. Uh, it's not great. This could happen as long as society continues this way. But what brings down governments, what brings down countries, what brings down social societies? Unemployment. And that's what I keep hearing here. We're putting all these businesses out. Yes, there will be new jobs, but they won't have near the employment. So does this really work when the world falls apart? When finally the world protests big corporations, because that's who's controlling all of this. How do, you, how do you see a future there when nobody has a job but robots and IA or AI implanted humans? <laughs> I get that question just about every form. And there's a, a polarized view on this topic. You, you would get one set of economists that believe that we've been here before, and every time we've been here, we've solved that problem. The other side of this discussion says we've never been here before, and the likelihood of job creation that offsets job loss is low, and the skill set required to actually do the jobs that are emerging is very high, and the likelihood of reskilling society to do those things at this pace is, is not, not a good uh, percentage. So the question on societal unrest is a real question. The biggest three factors in the next decade plus, so the 2020s, an aging workforce where in the short term, not enough workers to do the jobs. Automation accelerates to offset that problem. 
And as automate, automation accelerates, we set ourselves up for a late 2020, 2030 issue just as you described. So the view says, if you follow the logic, we, we are in a, a world of hurt by 2030, at least in the context of jobs. And that's where I come back to the question of, is this a jobs conversation or a reimagining of work conversation? That tipping point that I referenced says that if we reach a fully automated society, our view of work changes considerably. Work is just not what we, we viewed it to be. And then the question becomes, can we as humans live in that world? Were we built for that? Could you just stay home and do nothing or just pursue your passions? And some of the things that Bill Gates referenced in terms of helping our, our brothers and sisters in those other areas. Could we live as humans there? So I don't have a really good answer because I don't think anybody does. But I will tell you that I think the bigger question is not so much the job, if we can get here, from here to there, it's what is work in 2030, 2035. I think that's the bigger question. We've got time for one more. OK. I think you might have just tripled the alcohol sales tonight. With <laughs> and please don't tell Matt Sr. that he's going to live to be 140 because he'll never retire. Drive me insane for the rest of my life. And thank you for the new anxiety that I have. Um, can you talk about what military technology has an impact from all this and what you've heard about? Because if you guys are talking about all these things, and clearly we know that when something like this is developing, it's the world governments that get it first. Well, so two things. One is, is the military side of that question. The other is the, the, the impact of society in bad actors and what they do in using AI or biotechnologies in ways that human, humans haven't seen in years. Uh, there's a belief that says the good guys outnumber the bad guys, and they're just not going to be able to move in some of these areas fast enough where we won't have an answer. Now, that, that's speculation, but that's a belief that, that there's more good guys than bad guys. From a military standpoint, I think the whole notion of, of battle uh, clearly is going to change considerably as more of that is automated. Even, even wars are automated in the future, right? So personless kinds of battles, whether it's drone technologies or robots. Uh, the, the military conversation is an interesting one because that automation discussion kind of falls into the whole military side of that discussion as well. But, uh, and you're right, there are all kinds of things going on at the government, governmental levels to advance these things in ways that, that move our whole notion of the military in a different direction. I don't know if I answered your question. So with that, I know we're out of time. I appreciate the time and attention. I had a blast. I hope you enjoyed the uh, hour.